many decent people that wander in, but I think we ought to get started in order to do justice. Um, a a uh, Michigan State University grad is here to share the expertise from that part of the country. Please. Come all over. Well, I'm Allison Meyer, and I will give a little bit of background of myself um, because I'm pretty new to Wyoming. I'm originally from central Indiana. My parents actually have purebred shorthorns, and so I grew up um, in the purebred business. My dad's a hog buyer, my mom's a school teacher. You combine all that together, you end up with an animal science professor. And my brother's an ag lender for farm credit, so we kind of cover that gamut. Um, I went to Michigan State as an undergrad. I did my graduate work at the University of Missouri, North Dakota State. So I've been slowly inching my way west, um, and I've been here since August of 11. So how many people in here are students? Cool, so I'm going to do a little disregard if you're not a student. How many of you are in Block and Bridal? This is great. So I'm one of the current Block and Bridal advisors at UW. How many of you plan to go to UW? Eventually. Nobody? <laughs> oh, okay, I'm not going to be mad at you, but if you do, or wherever you go, I'm going to encourage you to stay involved in the club. Or some other club. But I think it's important. So we've noticed a lot of our transfer students don't stay involved, and we're trying to encourage that again. So, just so you know, we have a club that's rebuilding, and if anybody goes, they should stay there. Okay, how many of you come from um, a, an operation that has a beef house at home? Anybody with sheep? Okay, cool. So I'm going to show some sheep data. I'm not a cattle girl, but I had to work with sheep for a while when I was at NDSU, so I grew to love them for some reasons. Um, but today I'm going to talk some about fetal programming, and a lot of that's really just the concept of gestational nutrition and what that does to offspring. So I'm going to warn you that I give a lot of slides. That's why you have this book that you've been handed, um, a lot of pictures, figures. I talk fast and sometimes I move fast, so I always tell my students in class to stop me if I'm going way too fast, if I'm talking too fast, or if I make no sense to them. Because I, in my own head, I usually make sense. So feel free to ask me questions as we go, or ask me to slow down. So first I want to set up some of the concept of fetal programming, or I actually prefer developmental programming as a term. Um, and what it is for you. And the biggest picture here is that the maternal environment affects the developing offspring. And the problem for us is that this can be impaired development and actually can last for a really long time. I'm going to give you tons of examples. But I'm a very visual thinker, so to think about it very, um, very visually is just what happens to mama affects the offspring. Now, if you feel like your health is not very good, do not go home and blame your mothers, because it's not all your mom's fault, but there definitely is something to be said for the prenatal time. Now, if I were you, I would be sitting here saying, okay, I have red flag, problem. I don't understand the risk here. This is this supposed to be kind of a risk management workshop? What's the deal? Well, the big place where there's risk is, I showed you a nice picture before of a, of a you know, young cow who just gave birth to a nice calf, and maybe a nice calf later on in life. Well, what happens if what has happened to her ends up impacting meat? That's a problem, right? If it impacts meat in a good way, that would be good, but if it did something bad, like maybe took all of the marbling out of this T-bone, would it be very happy? No, that's not necessarily a good thing. What if it impacted um, maybe this daughter's ability to reproduce? that be a problem? Yeah, that could be a big problem. What if this calf actually ended up being a pretty weak, sickly, um, actually was sick a lot early, maybe died early, or had to be treated a lot? That would be a problem, right? If we go back to our nice, normal, healthy calf, the other thing that we have to think about here is, I'm sure, did anybody go to, I know a few of you went to John Ritten's talk earlier about drought and dealing with drought. You know, our big problem right now is what are we going to feed mama? So we've got to come up with something to feed her. So it's not just we don't want her offspring, but we also don't want to break the bank feeding our heifers and cows. So there's a lot of places where we have risk here, both in what we're doing with the female and what we could potentially do to offspring. Is everybody on the same page with me? Okay, good. Sorry, I'll probably keep asking questions. Because I'm in a classroom, it's easy to feel like I'm teaching right now. So, I'm sure you all are aware of this, but this is one of my favorite slides to use because it's really important to remind everybody that no matter what else we talk about, 
feed is always the highest cost for beef cow calf producers. And that doesn't matter if it's a drought year or not a drought year. So I don't want you to think that that's only true when hay is expensive and when corn's expensive, because this is always true. Of course, drought conditions, hay prices, and corn prices all really factor into this, no matter where you are. Students, I don't care where, if you are from an area where you grow corn or not, corn prices affect you. Never convince yourself that they don't. But to show you some actual data, this comes from 2011, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't our bad drought year. We don't have 12 data yet. Um, if you look at Wyoming here, and you see where USDA, um, the Economic Research Service, where they split up the regions, you see that Eastern Wyoming is part of the Northern Great Plains, and Western Wyoming is part of the Basin and Range. So we're currently in Basin and Range. Laramie is kind of on the line there in the, the southeast corner. In the eastern part here, the Northern Great Plains, these were the feed costs in 2011. So $483 per cow per year. And that was 75% of operating costs. Now it's true that the operating costs aren't counting in land costs and things like that, but that is a lot of money to keep a cow going. A lot, a lot. So if you consider the western part of the state, it's true that feed costs go down a little bit, partially because maybe you're not feeding as much grain there. But still we're at 70% of operating costs, over $360. So it costs a lot to feed cows. And that's a lot of why we don't necessarily want to offer cows any more feed than we have to, right? So the question is, what does she actually need? We want to make sure that this is a, a bred heifer that was on a research study of mine several years ago. We want to make sure that this bred heifer or this bred cow is getting enough nutrients, getting enough feed, so that she can be successful when she has a calf, right? We want her to be in good shape when she has a calf. We want her calf to be healthy. We want to wean her calf, and we want her to be bred again. So we know that what we feed her during gestation matters. If we think about in terms of a, essentially across the, the bottom here, we've got the day of pregnancy. So first month of pregnancy out to the last month of pregnancy in cows. This is considering just her NEM or her net energy of maintenance requirements, and that's kind of how we lump it all in with beef cattle um, for the whole year is this blue line. And, or for that, I guess that whole 240 day period. And then just during pregnancy. So if we consider just this top line, we see that, what do you think's happening here? Sorry, you didn't know you were going to have to participate, did you? Any guesses? Yeah, she's lactating. So as you see, there's this huge drop-off after weaning. And the big drop-off is just that it takes a lot of energy to make milk. We see that the whole time during the rest of gestation, actually, we're not getting up quite to the same point as late lactation even. But you see that there's this huge increase in the last, especially um, half to one-third of pregnancy that is going into getting a fetus to grow. So if you look at this increase down here, that's all due to pregnancy. Everybody buying what I'm selling you? Okay. So if we consider this just, let's look at fetal growth as a percent of total energy requirements. The red line we've got here. In mid-gestation, we go from about zero during early, or early gestation. We know that it does require some energy to get a fetus going, but not that much, it's pretty small about 7% on average during mid-gestation. And then for these last three months, we end up with almost 30%. So almost 30% of the energy that a cow needs. Let's say you've got March calving cows now, about 30% of the energy that those cows need right now is just for growing their fetus. Now, a lot of times that's overlooked. And one of the reasons that's overlooked is if we consider over an entire year, so this is the annual energy that's used for um, a beef cow. These are some different breeds across the bottom. Oh, you'll see we've even got a dairy breed in here. This is some old USDA data. It's not actually that old, but um, the orange bar here is just to keep her alive. That's her maintenance energy. Green is gestation, and blue is lactation. So as you see, really in pregnancy, if you average them out, it's only about 8% for an entire year of the energy that goes into that fetus. So a lot of times we forget about it because we say, hey, it's less than 10%, no big deal. The problem is, is that 
it's maybe not a big deal from an overall year standpoint, but down here, it's really important. And even in through here, what's going to that fetus is really important because it's setting them up for a lot of what's going to happen to them after they're born. So not only, and I'm going to give you a lot of kind of the theory behind this, because I like for people to understand why things happen. I'm a why person. My parents love that I now learn about why and tell people why, because all I ask as a kid was why. So they feel it's pretty appropriate. But I want to talk to you about the practical side of this. So the question a lot of times is, what are we feeding? Is what we're feeding actually providing this bump? And I'm going to go a little further than that and say, really, there's only one of these pictures that came from this region, and that's just north of Laramie. The rest of them are more Midwestern. Um, but what kind of environment are we feeding them in? So we're going to talk a little bit about how maybe the differences here in the feed quality that we have, the differences in the environments, are going to play a role in this. In this region, um, and this is some data that actually is from UW, it is comparing improved pasture and native range the improved pastures here in green because it's more nutritive and the yellow bars are native range. So if you take a look at these, and these again are real numbers from about mm, five to six years ago, we can see that if this is a February calving system at mid gestation, about day 150 to 180, and these are all crude protein as a percent of dry matter, we've got plenty of protein in our improved pasture. Even as we move into um, the next phase here, we still have enough protein. A lot of times we say those cows are really needing, you know, six, seven percent protein at least. So we're meeting that. Now, by the time we get to the end of, or closer to the end of gestation, day 180 to 210, we've gotten really pretty far down into the protein here at five percent, and that's the improved pasture. If you take a look at the native range, you see that the native range never really has enough protein for our cows. And so without going super deep into ruminant nutrition, we know if you don't have enough protein, microbes actually aren't doing a very good job of breaking down fiber, right? They can't actually work. They've got to have energy and protein both. So that's a problem. Your intakes are actually going to be decreased. And so we've got lots of issues with this. But hopefully this is just showing you that this actually is a problem here. Not necessarily for everyone. I mean, this is just data from a few years in one place. But in general, we have to worry, especially with our native range, that our cows don't truly have enough nutrients during that time. And that's why we need to think about um, what's happening with them and if we need to do something to fix it. So in general, what I'm going to refer to as nutrient restriction, which sometimes I think sounds a little more rocket science than it is, it's just underfeeding. It's not feeding them quite enough. But nutrient restriction happens during gestation. And it's pretty common for it to happen during gestation sometimes by design. Sometimes after we wean calves, we're perfectly fine with letting cows lose weight, right? Because it's actually not a bad time to do it. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. So if this occurs commonly in beef cattle, sometimes in a planned way, sometimes in a not very planned way. And the, the thing to remember is that it's true that cows first send their nutrients to their calf. That's what they do. That's what they're programmed to do. But at some point, that's going to stop. It has its limits. And a lot of times before it stops, she's going to use up her body stores of fat and protein. So that's why we a lot of times worry about, you know, gestational nutrition and right before they calve, making sure we feed cows enough so that they're at a good body condition when they calve. Because otherwise, they're going to be thin and we're not going to be able to breed them back because lactation is really energetically um, demanding, right? So it's important to remember these things. Even past that, though, one of the biggest issues is that not only is, if you think about it, a cow is competing with her calf. So typically, she's going to put nutrients in her calf, and she's going to do that at the expense of herself. But there's a lot of competition for that. And so if we're talking about growing heifers, they're also growing. And so the calf and the growth of the heifer are competing. If we're talking about lactating cows, then we have even more competition. So think about the two-year-old lactating heifer that we're trying to get rebred or that we have gotten rebred. There's lots and lots of competition then. And even past that, a lot of our cows in gestation, because in this part of the country we calve in the spring, some of us winter, some of us 
what you could call summer in some places, but it's really spring here, we have a lot of cold stress. Well, cold stress is also competing. If you're cold, you use energy to try to stay warm, and that increases energy requirements. So the question is, what about winter? And that's actually one of my favorite aspects of this in this part of the country, is a lot of times we forget about it. These are actually some cows in Iowa that you know are grazing some stockpiled forage through the snow. They look pretty unhappy in some ways, you think, and then you start to look at them. If you're a cow person, you think, actually, those girls have it pretty good. They can still get to the grass. They're eating. They're not covered in snow. Life's not that bad. So yeah, it's taking them some extra energy to get to stay warm in this situation, but not quite as much as this girl. So can you tell what we have here? It looks kind of like just a ball of snow, but here's a nose and an ear tag. So if you do the math, we've got a very unhappy cow here. I think this was in Colorado, the winter of 09, during all those really bad storms. You might have gotten it on email, because I remember I got this actually as an email and had to go back and find it. Um, but can you imagine, do you think this girl needs a lot more energy to stay warm? Yeah, and she's also not eating a lot at that moment, so this is pretty dramatic. But it's definitely true that winter requires energy. So the NRC, actually, in, in the one that's going to be revamped here in the next couple of years, um, has what we call energy multipliers for these conditions. And so if you think about it, you would take the NEM and you would multiply it by these numbers based on the conditions. So if you go down here, you've got wind at 1 or 10 miles an hour. It's true they don't have 40 miles an hour. So Wyoming's not really covered terribly well um, by this, this chart. Then they also have some temperatures here, 30, 10, and negative 10. I lived in Fargo for four years. Fargo's not covered very well by this because negative 40's not on this chart. You also see this is with dry coat and wet coat. So you can compare a cow that's dry at 30 degrees with very little wind, doesn't need that much more energy. And I would actually say that most cows in Wyoming, if they're in this conditions, are right at basal because they're used to it. You know, that's perfectly fine. Now cows from Florida at this point would be above it if they lived here or somewhere else, even though it was at that point. But if you think about it, and you go all the way to the worst case scenario down here, if a cow is wet and cold and it's windy, then she needs a lot of energy. And actually, I always say when I lived in um, Indiana and Missouri especially, the cows that I thought were the most unhappy were the ones at about 40 degrees that were wet, it was raining, it was kind of windy, it was muddy. I mean, those girls are in, are in a bad situation. The important thing to remember is that this is occurring during this time when that calf is growing in utero and needs a lot of energy too, but the cow has to use a bunch of it just to keep herself warm through shivering thermogenesis, non-shivering thermogenesis, Lots of stuff that, that hopefully you've learned about. So if we go past that and think in bigger, more practical terms, this is taking an entire year and splitting it into some different parts of a cow's life. And with that, then, we're giving the energy requirement for that time as the black line here. And essentially, protein requirements are going to follow that exact same line. Really, most, energy, or most nutrient requirements are going to fall there. You see I've got like a, a March calving system here. So we have late gestation that's falling here in, in uh, early winter. Early lactation that's falling here in kind of late winter, early spring. And then you can go through the rest of the time here. Again, with weaning um, kind of in, let's say that's September. So if we think about this whole period, one of the interesting things, and I'm not gonna talk about this too much, but if you have any questions, let me know, because this is a really cool thing in my mind is we already know that we can do some interesting things, like if we want to put weight on a cow, we want to do it here. Why are we going to do it here a lot of times? Or why could we do it here easily? Energy. Yeah, she doesn't need that much for herself at that point, so if we want to put weight back on her, that's a good option. Is it very easy to put weight on a cow here? No, it's, it can be almost impossible, especially if she's milking at all. So the interesting thing is, that's been kind of our traditional paradigm. There's some cool work from Nebraska that shows that if you actually cycle weight off of a cow here, it's not that terrible for the calf or even for her. Because when you start to really feed her again down here, she's got compensatory growth going in her favor. She gains more. 
her calf is still in good shape and she has a better chance to breed back. So there's some interesting things and ways we can use this. We also though can superimpose on top of it what's actually happening to the calf during gestation at the same time. So on the last slide we show early gestation here, mid gestation, late gestation. On top of that you could put early gestation, kind of this part, some mid and late gestation. So at this time, you know, you see right here around breeding, conception, there's a period around there that actually is really important for lots of things. I won't talk about it too terribly much. Here in the first half of gestation, um, we have a couple of really important things. Uh, sorry, I thought I had different colors coming up, but apparently I was imagining a different presentation. We've got a couple of really important things happening, and one of the biggest ones is the placenta growing. The other really big one is a fetus getting its organs actually developed. So to show you first the placenta, does everybody know what the placenta is? Okay, that's good. Because sometimes when I give talks, people say they have no idea what the placenta is, and that hurts a little bit. So the placenta is just simply the site of attachment for the fetus and the cow. And what's happening here is nutrients are being transferred and waste is being transferred, right? Mom saying, here's nutrients. Baby saying, take the waste away. So this is a schematic, a little cartoon of what a uh, um, placentome looks like in A. If you look here um, on the entire uterus, this is what a cow's would look like. And then B, this is kind of showing how the blood of the dam, which is red here, and the blood of the fetus are actually interacting. So it's a really super cool process that I could go into for a long time, but I'm not going to. Main take home message is that during this time, it's really important for the placenta to grow. Because if you don't have all of this set up really well, you can't get any nutrients that you have to the calf because it's all being delivered by this tissue um, in the blood. So if we think about this first, this placental growth in early gestation, the next thing that's really happening is fetal organ growth. This is actually one of my favorite slides because um, this is a day 140 fetus that a lot of times maybe you know we're picturing this is what a very early fetus um, is going to look like. During that period, and this is almost right on because day 140 would essentially be mid-gestation, we end up with something that looks like this. And a day 140 fetus actually has, these are testicles, so look, the testes are, are starting to be pretty well formed. This is a heart in my, it's in my hand, this hand actually. So you can imagine it was sitting about like this. And this is its GI tract. I'm actually a GI tract person. I dissect guts regularly. It sounds weird to people, but it's quite fun. Um, and this is what a fetal GI tract looks like at that point. It's not going to eat for another 140 days. And yet still, there's the liver. Um, this is actually the stomach complex. You can see this whole thing actually the stomach complex. The intestines are really starting to form quite well. So we've gone from almost nothing to this highly formed calf at this point. So from here, what these have to do is really grow, and so the end of gestation is really all about growth. And I tell you all this stuff, not partially because I'm a science nerd who loves cows, so I think it's really cool to know this stuff, but it's important because actually what happens to the dam and the fetus during this time is very, can sometimes act in very different ways than what happens to it during this time. And so essentially, what we're doing nutrition-wise is actually <coughs> impacting them different, which I'll get into a little bit um, today, but not a ton. Also, at the end here of this growth, essentially everything, whether it's calves or us or puppies, have to get ready to be born. And then even right after you're born, you go through this period where you, know, you still are getting acclimated to the environment, and a lot of um, organs and tissue systems are, are really getting going. So it's really easy for the maternal environment to impact these as well. So again, this is showing you a figure of fetal weight across gestation, zero to about 283 days. Do I have any questions so far? You've all been really quiet. No, everybody's good? Okay. So if we split these just into early, mid, and late gestation, my question is, are we going to change fetal growth at any of these times? So vote with me. Do you think that if we don't give enough feed to a cow, when will we be most likely to change the birth weight of a calf? Who's going to vote early gestation? Who's 
going to vote late gestation? Okay, who's going to vote late gestation? Okay, let's see how you do. So, typically with early gestation, we don't. We, we usually, I mean, in this point, your biggest problem is that you're probably going to lose your whole pregnancy. That's why sometimes heat stress um, in the summer can be a real issue, but typically that's not, you know, birth weight's not an issue unless you continue that in nutritional insult the whole way across. Mid gestation, it's possible. There's a couple of data sets that say maybe yes, it's true, but a lot of times, not quite so much unless it extends into here. If it extends the whole rest of the last two thirds, then yes, you're gonna see a difference. And the last third, the answer is actually maybe. So in sheep, the answer is almost exactly yes, because sheep are a little more sensitive. With, with beef cattle, especially mature cows, sometimes actually you don't um, see much difference in birth weight, but if you're going to, it's gonna be here. So this is just giving you kind of a list of some times, because this is actually a big debate in our area among scientists, whether birth weight's always changed. Sometimes birth weight's decreased, and sometimes it isn't. Now a lot of times I get the question, what about increasing birth weight? Because increasing birth weight is a bigger issue, right, in some ways? We'll talk about that a little bit, but actually it's a little more difficult. We now think it's more difficult to change than we used to. So the general take home from this is, it depends on a lot of factors. Some of it's nutrients, you know, how much feed are you actually giving? Which nutrients are they? Is it all an energy thing, a protein thing? What is it? A good bit of it's probably environment. Some of that's due to how much extra she needs to stay in that environment. Some of it's definitely due to cow age. It's a lot worse in young females, not because they're still growing. And a good bit of it too has to do with breed. It has to do with selection. Um, have you, how have you selected your animals for your environment? You know, if you've selected cows that can pretty much go out and live on their own, then they probably are going to be less impacted. Um, my parents' relatively high input, intensive management purebreds are impacted more. So the question, and this is what my dad asks me all the time, especially with the breed that has a birth weight problem, um, why is a low birth weight bad? I wish that you could decrease the birth weight of every calf born on the place. Well, here's the problem with the decreased birth weight. We want to decrease birth weight through genetics. Genetics are the right way to do it. The wrong way to do it is changing the growth trajectory of a calf. So if we're changing the growth trajectory of a calf in late gestation, we're going through this line, because we're not feeding its mother enough, then we're causing some potential issues. And some of those are, you know, are they not developing right at the end? I often call, you know, the calves that come out half-baked, they just aren't quite, you know, they're not, not very uh, vigorous, that's one of my, my things here, they're not very strong, um, not necessarily very, very healthy, they're not very mature, maturity is probably a better word than how baked they are, but um, also a big issue in this part of the country is cold tolerance, right, because these calves that I'm describing typically aren't terribly cold tolerant. And so um, we need animals to reach their potential in utero and not actually be smaller, even though they might be easier calving because of a nutritional insult. Does that make sense? You kind of buy what I'm selling on that one? My dad still asks me if I'm really you know, right on this. And I asked him how many years I went to school and he still doesn't think that means much. <laughs> so coming back to the big, overall picture of fetal programming. Hopefully, again, you're kind of seeing, I was trying to explain to you how some of this happens and why some of it happens. But now I want to talk more about some specific, especially here, it's not just, when I use the term environment, I'm meaning a lot of different things, but not just environment, but most specifically nutrition and some of the specific offspring effects that we've observed. And I use the big scientific we because I was only involved in a tiny bit of this. So one of the first things that I actually say is the most important that we have observed is that early calf health can really um, be altered based just on how we're feeding the dam. And again, if you think back to actual life experience, you can probably think of times where this, you know, you can think of those examples. If you have a really big snowstorm right before a bunch of cows calve and they didn't have access to much feed, they come in a little thin, you probably can think of calves that weren't very vigorous were a little sicker, where you had more death loss. Well, to show you some data from that, this is actually a pretty old uh, data set that was from UW. 
And um, this one is showing you uh, cows that were on a high plane of nutrition. So they were over their nutrient requirements during gestation, especially mid to late. And then the gold is low nutrition. And you can see that this is just the percent alive at birth. We had almost all of them that were alive. The high nutrition lost a few more um, of the low nutrition. And then the really cool thing is that if you go from birth to weaning, obviously there was very, very little death loss there in the high nutrition group. And the low nutrition group, there was a lot more death loss. So especially in this part of the country where we sell a lot of cats at weaning, this is the biggest ticket item in my mind. So we can talk a little bit about why some of this is. And again, I actually study the GI tract. I study the small intestine a lot. And we know that the small intestine is less developed of calves and lambs whose mothers have more nutrient. We call them sometimes insults. Because it doesn't just mean they didn't get enough. Sometimes it's that they got too much. Or they didn't get enough of one thing. But we know that the digestive system, lungs, hearts, liver, and kidneys can be less developed or changed um, in animals whose mothers weren't well nourished during gestation. We also know that they can have decreased ground fat, and calves use that to create heat. So of course in this part of the country, that's a huge issue. And also, a lot of times those cows, and especially heifers, have less colostrum, and in their colostrum have less immunoglobulins. So actually they have less of a chance for passive immunity. This is some new data. I don't know of any that exists in cattle, but I would like to generate some that's like this. These are actually ewe lambs that if you look at the treatments down here, these controls were fed to their nutrient requirements. The 60% was 60% of that, and the 140% was 140% of that. So this shows you that actually ewe lambs, their colostrum production was lower if they were underfed or if they were overfed during the last two thirds of gestation. So to me this is cool because actually one of the biggest reasons I think this is I got into this line of work was from watching fat show heifers have problems and thinking that was really interesting and I wanted to fix it. So this is actually the fat show heifer model. That wasn't the purpose of the research, but that's how I think of it. And this is more of the, you know, you threw the heifers out with the cows after they were bred. They couldn't compete for feed. Maybe it was a hard winter. That is more of this, this situation. I'll also tell you that Immunoglobulins, total IgG, if you compare them across this, followed. So that meant that in this situation, these lambs, but if it holds true in cattle like I think, these calves wouldn't have gotten as much chance for a good immune system. Dr. Meyer? Yes, sir. Um, just to get a little more specific, are you talking caloric restriction for how many days? Or? This is both energy and protein. Okay. And it started, this was a U model, it started day 40 and went through birth, through parturition. Yeah, and in this one, I'll show you a little bit more data. We actually kept, this was, this was part of my PhD work where I really thought my buzzard lost his mind. He told me, we're gonna milk 40 ewes three times a day by hand. We ended up milking, or 80 ewes. We ended up milking 40 ewes twice a day with a milking machine. So we got some cool milk data. Um, we pulled the lambs off and fed them milk replacer. And interestingly, we saw that even when we fed them all the same milk replacer, and IgG, they still are in um, colostrum replacer. They still grew differently. If you put, if you kept them here, they would have especially grown differently here. I, I love the milk data. He always makes fun of me because I hated getting it so much, but I think it's such cool, such cool pictures. So if we move into some other data, this is with cattle, um, and some of you might know Rick Funston in the Sand Hills of Nebraska. I'm going to show a lot of his data today because he's got some of the best especially the best volume of data in beef cattle of late gestation nutrition. And his general model is no supplement or protein supplement, either on native range or on corn stock residue. And so these are uh, four years worth of studies, where if you look across here, you see that in general, really the whole way across, if mother had protein supplement, actually her calves had increased growth from birth to weaning. So that's pretty cool, right? They actually were growing faster. So the question is, well, is this the calves can grow faster, or is it that the calves have more milk? So this can, is the, can, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering if you could go back to this. So is this supplement during the last 
trimester. Yep. Okay, so last trimester. Yeah, this stuff is generally all last trimester. Okay, it's not always super, super clean and exactly how long it is, but it's typically, you know, that last 90, 100 days. We're in there. So, again, if we look at this, you know, the guys, the red bar here, and these were both peppers, cows, and um, steer cows. I don't remember when they castrated in this study, or these studies, um, but they were both growing faster. So, it, it's true that actually in his studies where they have measured milk, they've not seen, observed any differences yet. They haven't done it very often. So this is going back to that sheep study that I talked about. This was the initial data I showed you with colostrum. If you follow it across, you see that these orange, the orange line, those are the ewes that were nutrient restricted, were fed 60% of what they needed. They stayed lower. It looked like they were thinking about rebounding, but actually we killed them there at the end, so we'll never really know what happened. Um, it's, during that time, they were, they were getting some compensatory growth themselves. Their guts were growing back and all of that stuff, um, but it was at the expense of milk production. An interesting thing is that these overnourished ewes actually um, ended up coming back up. Part of that's because around puberty, post-pubertal, pre-pubertal, they were all about the same nutrition. So it's not that they were depositing a bunch of fat in their udders. That's not why these girls couldn't milk, so we're not sure why their colostrum was so low. But as you can imagine, if the same thing holds true with calves, if these, if these calves or lambs can't grow that fast to begin with, then you don't give them enough milk. If they're not doing a whole lot of robbing from somebody else's mom, then it's gonna be a lot more hard for them, or a lot harder at that point for them to grow as well. So that's getting us to weaning. Now the other take home point I wanna give from that is again, if we're in a place where you're selling calves at weaning, you wanna have as many calves as you can that are as high of weaning weight as possible to sell, right? within the realm of, of reasonable, you know, management. You don't necessarily want to spend a lot more money to do that, but we know that that actually is a very obvious end point that we can be paid for. Now, when we get into the post-weaning management, this is where, you know, if you are actually um, retaining ownership of a feedlot, retaining replacement heifers, or if you are working directly with someone who always buys your calves because they're good and they know them to be, then you have maybe the ability to make um, make some money from this. Otherwise, that's one of the big problems with our segmented beef industry, but that's a whole other story. So if we continue on into this and we look just at post-weaning growth, these are the same um, fun stints. Sorry, I don't, I don't know what happened to the other, um, the other line that was up here. But this is the same fun stint sort of studies where we had no supplement, or the red is again protein supplement, and this, is showing you in this final feedlot weight um, if we compare them on a winter range situation or corn residue. And so that's where the cows were when they were supplemented or not. So as you see here, if the cows were on corn residue, it didn't matter if they were supplemented for their calves. And here, if the cows were on winter range and if they were supplemented, their steer calves weighed more at the end of the feedlot phase when they were all the same age. So they were growing more. So that's another case for why protein supplementation matters. Here, this is pre, sorry, the second one here is pre-breeding weight. And you can see again that the red bar here, protein supplemented um, cows gave birth to heifers who their pre-breeding weight was greater than the ones who weren't supplemented. So they were growing faster. Now, sometimes we get really hung up in growth. And if you were in a Dr. Ritten's talk, you heard my little tirade about efficiency. Feed efficiency really does matter in here because growth is important, but if we have to feed an animal a lot to grow, maybe that's a problem. This is some Wyoming data from a few years ago, and this shows the finishing phase RFI, which is a measure of feed efficiency that is extremely popular right now um, because it helps take some of the difference in body size out of the equation. And this shows you that these were the maternal treatments. Actually, if we back up to more early mid-gestation, day 45 to 185, we see that these controls, they were fed NRC requirements, they were fed um, to meet their nutrient requirements. Their steer calves, and actually these are heifer calves as well, were more efficient in the finishing phase, compared especially to the calves whose mothers were underfed during that part of gestation. 
So unfortunately, this was year one data, year two data. They look essentially right here at zero. Um, have huge standard error bars. So it's, we're not entirely certain why maybe in one year it appears to impact more than another year. There's not a whole lot of other data like this, but it's highly likely that if you're changing growth and you're changing function of tissue and things like that, you're probably also changing feed intake. There's also some data from other species like rats and even a little bit of sheep data that says that you might be changing how much animals like to eat. So maybe if you can't stop eating, you can try blaming your mother. I tried that. She didn't really take, take to that blame either. Um, but there's something to be said for appetite too. So essentially, performance, growth, feed efficiency all can potentially be changed um, during gestation. Okay, so maybe now again, those things we certainly can measure and we understand that they all are very important. But this is another one that is um, especially important and costly. If you think about just feedlot health and how many, are or, or how many calves are actually treated, this still comes from the, the Johnson set of studies. Um, this one was a no supplement, again, versus protein supplement. And you see that about 10, 11, 12% of calves in this no supplemented bar were actually treated in the feedlot versus less than 2% of the red. So it's not only that these calves maybe were not growing as well and were a little sicker when they were first born, but actually even you know, when they were 12 months old, we still were at that same point. This is a little different study. It actually comes out of um, New Mexico. And this one just is the type of supplement during gestation. It's during late gestation again, about the last third, cotton seed meal, or this high ruminally undegradable or bypass protein self-fed supplement. And that was based more around things like blood meal, feather meal, things of that nature. And so again, this one shows that this is a lot of calves to be treated in the feedlot. Most of them were just on receiving, but still, if you compare about a 45% to a 10% um, pull rate, there's a huge difference in costs there. So interesting things that we really don't understand why this happens, but we're knowing more and more that overall health is impacted um, by what happened to the cow during gestation. If we move over then into endpoints, like carcass yield, and again, this is especially important for people who are retaining ownership um, through the feedlot phase. This first one is just going to show you crop carcass weight, and you're probably not surprised to see that in these Funston studies from Nebraska, the protein supplemented steer calves had greater hot carcass weight than the non supplemented calves. Again, those were their mothers that were supplemented or not, but these calves also weighed more at finishing. So it makes sense that they had more carcass weight. If we look at the next one, this just shows you that yield grade wasn't different. So that means that it's not that these calves were fatter. They actually, you know, both were about a 2.5 average yield grade. Despite that, though, there actually were some differences in carcass weight or carcass quality in these studies. And so we see that more calves graded choice. And as you can tell, these are calves that have the ability to grade choice in general. Um, they, I'll tell you, they weren't fed overly long. Um, this was kind of a conservative model. So there were more calves that graded choice if their mothers were fed protein supplement during late gestation, and there were more that were in upper two-thirds choice. So there were also more that were hitting the CAB market and getting more premiums um, on the rail as well. This is actually some UW data, and this goes back um, into or some UW, data, UW and Miles City um, data in conjunction. This is again more, um, it goes a little bit into late gestation, but this was focused around the mid gestation. And this was native range versus improved pasture, which you saw earlier um, when I'm showing you nutrient quality. So this shows you that even hot carcass weights being changed in mid gestation, 12th rib fat was actually changed. Of course, this isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, but interestingly, marbling was also changed. And so we can't say it's only late gestation. And in fact, there's people who would you know, shoot me on site for saying that. Um, it definitely can happen during mid gestation. And the take home message is that, again, things that were happening, you know, were happening maybe 14 to 19 months earlier are actually impacting what that carcass looks like as far.
which I think, and maybe even more if there was a stalker phase in the middle. I think that's really cool, obviously. So now we move into the heifer situation, um, which might be especially more relevant in this area of the country if we're worried about um, replacement heifers. This one is showing you again with some more Funston data, no supplement or protein supplement during late gestation. The age at puberty was actually less than heifers whose mothers were supplemented. So that can be a good thing, especially because it's not obnoxiously early, so that's, that's good. Also, pregnancy rates during that, this first time, uh, or first conception, not first conception, but uh, during the first breeding of these heifers were greater also in the heifers whose mothers were protein supplemented. I'll tell you that this followed through so that these heifers also calved or had more calves earlier in the calving season. They also had um, heavier weaning weight calves because of that and continued on. Also, if you've heard Scott Lake talk much recently about this sort of thing, one of his biggest things is these are calving earlier in the season. That means that they have a better likelihood of actually staying in your breeding season window for the rest of their life. If they're later, then they're going to fall. It'll be more likely to come up open. So this is a very a big laundry list that I, I put together a couple years ago. So it might be even a little bit um, light on all the all the data. But a laundry list of all the, all of the organs and tissues that can actually be affected by this. We talked about a few. We especially talked about muscle and fat. We talked some about reproduction. I'll tell you there's a lot of things that can be uh, impacted. And some of them can be quite harmful. So if we think big picture, like stepping back to look at the really big picture, this was essentially what I was telling you initially is just that um, maternal nutrition and environment is impacting overall calf effects. Now, it's acting through changing growth and or, uh, in organ development, actually organ development and growth, and that is changing, um, that's prenatal, that's changing postnatal growth, and that's changing postnatal organ function, and that in turn is, is impacting this. In, this, in the research world, a lot of us are doing this sort of thing where we're trying to figure out what's happening during the fetal stage or maybe how it's impacting at this point. But what really matters to all of you, and what I always try to when I explain to my you know, dad what I'm doing with my life, I always come back to this stuff because even though we don't really understand how it all works yet, we have enough data to say it's true that what we do during pregnancy affects calves later. Not every time, and then with cows, the cool thing is, is cows can put up with a lot. And they have a really big swing. But we know enough to know that it's important to pay attention to what's going on in here, or else we could end up with some problems. So the question is, how do I use this? And I'm not an extension, so I'm not nearly as good at bringing it all back to a big picture audience as, as a lot of the extension guys. I don't want to tell you what to do. But the biggest thing is, I think, to do what you can where you are with what you have. I have this on my desk, and when I have a bad day, I try to remind myself there's only so much I can do with my current situation. So if you think about this from a cow standpoint, there's some management um, considerations I'm going to give you, but those management considerations are all pretty much um, centered around these three things. So to me, the big gear here is your cow herd. Right, so cow herd is your factory, and we talked a lot in the, the drought one earlier this morning about not getting rid of your factory and treating your factory well and all those sorts of things. Your cow herd's the biggest thing, and knowing your cow herd and knowing what, um, what they can handle and paying attention to them. And the other big thing, of course, is your feed. Because if you're in a bad year, you might have to get creative, and so you're probably not going to get to do all of the things that you want to do at that moment. So, of course, we have to think about that. But the other thing that sometimes gets forgotten is what are the goals? If you're going to sell your calves at weaning, you want to maximize the number that live. And you want to make sure that they're healthy, and you want to make sure they're growing. Those are your goals, right? But maybe you're not as worried about the harvest composition because you're selling them and never seeing them again. Okay, that's good to know. If you're really worried about your heifer calves, then maybe you want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're seeing good things come out of your replacement heifers from this. If you're retaining ownership in a feedlot, same situation. So if we go into those, these are my big, I think there's six of them here, these are my big six um, management 
suggestions, which you've probably always seen before. And a lot of what you observe, or when you when you see this list, you've probably been told this will get your cows bred back. Well, the really cool thing is, if it helps get your cows bred back, it's probably going to help your calves end up with good nutrition during gestation. So it ends up being a, a good thing on two ways. The first one is not to overlook what cows need before they calve. Sometimes we have this mentality of, I'm going to forget about her until she calves. That's not a good thing. And along with that, um, we need to consider that matching our cow herd and the nutrient requirements to our forages is super important. That's why I don't have any cows from Indiana here because, to be quite honest, they would probably starve to death because they're used to having a higher plane of nutrition. Also, thinking about when we calve, you know, this is a lot of times what we talk about. It is really important in that respect as well. Managing heifers and young cows separately is important because those young cows or heifers are still growing. Um, those two-year-olds have a lot of problems in their lives once they calve. And so again, these things all really help with our gestational nutrition. Um, the others are to attempt to maintain cows in a moderate body condition throughout gestation. And if I had to pick a time when I would keep them in the best condition, it would be late gestation. And I wouldn't try to get them fat during that time, but I would make sure they were at least moderate, for sure. Now, part of that is, if you know that they're in a bad body condition, but you don't do anything about it, it doesn't really help the situation. So my suggestion is, that's the time when you supplement when necessary to maintain your body condition score, or you change your forage um, sources, or you, that's when I would manage more closely during gestation. Past that, um, if calves are born to thin cows, or especially heifers, my other thing is to make sure they get enough colostrum. Now it's got to pencil out, but if you know that a cow is thin, think that her colostrum is probably bad. I'm certainly not a vet, and we have at least one in the room, but that's, that's my take on it in general. Um, if you want to save a calf, I think at this point, probably saving a calf is much more um, advantageous than not having to buy colostrum replacer. That's just my take. Do not, you know, do the pen pencil it out yourselves. But I think that's important as well. So if we go back and think about these considerations, I'm going to challenge you to take these management, the little six management bullet points, as your, your take home from this and figure out how they fit in here. And then know that a lot of the science that I've shown you, we're still trying to learn. And a cool thing about the science that we're trying to learn is we're trying to figure out how to give good recommendations so that we don't just say, feed your cows well all the time, because oh, that's crazy. It's one of the best things about beef cows and ewes, if it, for those of you that have ewes, we know that with ruminants, we can cycle weight off, we can take put weight back on, and that's a good thing. So we're trying to learn what times are the most important, and these are the four main times that we've been focusing on. You could probably tell that my take is much more on this late part, but there's others who believe that even around breeding is actually the most important um, for that developing calf because of the embryonic things that are going on. Also, the other thing a lot of us are working on is are there specific nutrients that you can use? So personally, I've been involved with some work with arginine and amino acid that we believe, I'm going to say it's the magic bullet, it's actually not. Um, but I did recently find it in some shampoo and conditioner that you can buy at Walmart. And apparently it's the magic bullet for hair too, so I'm going to give it a try. But we think that it's possible that sometimes maybe just one amino acid, or a fatty acid, or a mineral or vitamin, or just energy, or just protein, actually could help fix some of these other problems. So maybe you don't worry about you know, how much energy your cow's getting as much, but you do worry about a specific amino acid. And if you can put that in a mineral block, and that will fix the problem in late gestation, that would solve a lot of problems. Unfortunately, we're not to that point yet, but we think it's possible. And that's the direction this is going in. I think this will go. So I'll end with this. And this is my really cheesy take on the world. I like quotes. My friends always make fun of me because I always have quotes everywhere that motivate me. But the future depends on what you do today is a famous Gandhi quote. And I'm going to add it on top of these happy North Dakota cows with the future of your calf crop depends on what you do today. And that's especially useful right now because we're in late gestation. So it fits into my propaganda pretty well. 
But it's true that a lot of times we don't worry about calf crops until they show up on the ground. And actually that's a little too late because we've already set up some stuff. And so it's true that you don't want to, you know, spend a thousand dollars a cow to make her fed well, but that's part of the reason that, you know, it actually makes sense to maybe do some liquidating when you can't actually feed them on um, things of that nature because we actually are impacting not just her, not just the, that set of cows that are currently here, but also future generations as well. So with that, I'd like to say thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions now or into the next break. Hopefully, I didn't bore you to death or talk to you guys. So that would be really bad. Thank you. Research or th stuff that you're recommendation you can point us to around um, sort of mineral programs and their relation uh, during late gestation. I mean, we, we all, I guess, I think we think we know about proteins. It's like, okay, we're going to supplement protein, but there's a lot of theories. Should we put stuff on a protein only, or is a protein plus a mineral supplement? And... Um, it depends. Sure. But I didn't talk much about minerals. Um, I would say if I go just strictly on that. I should have, and usually if I give this slide, I say that one of the biggest things to worry about here is um, actually supplementing minerals. Now that's not going to change your body conditions for, um, but and vitamins. But we know that you know colostrum quality is very much related to mineral and vitamin nutrition. Also, the other interesting thing is, is that that calf is accumulating. Or essentially, it's going to end up with the same mineral status that its mother's blood has. So if she's way low in a lot of trace minerals that are important for immune function, the calf's going to be low too. And so then a lot of times if the colostrum's also low, you end up with this bad situation that just perpetuates itself. So it's important to have minerals and vitamins. Now, if we get into a specific type, um, saying like organic versus inorganic minerals, I believe that you should use what you believe works well and economically works for your operation. And sometimes that's the really good stuff because you believe that it does that much better, but it isn't always necessarily. Now when you talk about adding protein, you only really need to add protein if your forage is protein deficient. And so that's something that sometimes, you know, I'll go back to Indiana and I'll say to my dad, why are there protein tubs out there? You live in a place where there's enough protein in your grass that's not digestible. What are you doing? And so he's I've finally gotten through to him that that's not as important. You've seen our pastures around here. Though. Yeah, here you have a protein <laughs> problem, right? <laughs> we kind of assume. <laughs> in general, I mean, maybe some of your improved pasture isn't depending on when you're grazing and things like that. So, I mean, I would assume that if you need protein, it doesn't really matter how you feed it, in my mind. Um, if we start to learn more of this stuff, you know, where we can tell you that actually it's more important to do um, under, uh, a bypass protein or specific amino acids, then that's great. Um, but, you know, during late gestation, when it comes to minerals and vitamins, the biggest thing is don't, I say that's the time not to skimp, especially. Um, I, mean, I guess that the reason I ask is that a lot of times we will go out and clip our fields and, and our spring growth and do our summer mineral program so that we know what's in there. I don't think I've ever clipped my barley stubble fields that I'm turning them cows on and keeping them on until the last month before they're, right. you know, and then when I start, you know, block them and feed them. But well, how do they look? Oh, they look fine. I mean, that's the other thing that sometimes I, I have this competition on the first day of my nutritional management class last semester. Uh, we forget that we can tell a lot about how animals are doing nutritionally by looking at them. And if you're not having a lot of cat health problems, I'm saying you're probably doing pretty well. But if you are, then, I mean, I've noticed especially, um, you probably, actually, it's interesting because this region has so many random toxicities that pop up in it, but it doesn't have as many deficiencies as maybe where I'm from. Like selenium deficiencies are hugely, you know, common, especially like when I was in Michigan, that was a huge thing, right? So if you had all of a sudden a year when you lost a bunch of calves and they were really sick, oftentimes you go back and look at forage tests and go, oh my God. This was a bad year for minerals. Um, so, you know, if it's one of those situations, you might find out that's true. Um, but a lot of times it, I mean, I always say get a get a forage test every time you can, right? It's easy for me to say that. I think if I were you, I'd back up a couple of months because I think that last three months is really important. And that's why 
I like to say these things because it's easier to forget about cows when they're not pears. And, I mean, that's when we're not trying to get them bred because we know they're bred and they don't have calf inside, we can forget about them. But it's actually a really important time that it's, it, you know, we shouldn't forget about them. Sorry, I probably just talked in circles more than what do you do? I've seen a lot of people like bring cows in and they're really thin, like through that second trimester, and then they pour the feed to them in the third trimester, and then the calves just get huge and they pull them, and the calves never grow very fast. It seems like those real big calves just never pick up and go like a smaller calf will. Mm -hmm. But then I've seen cows have been kind of starved down the whole way through it, and the calves are just dinks the whole time. So, what do you kind of do if your cows come in a little thin about winter pasture? To well, honestly, we don't know, and this is one of those problems where. Um, Actually, the research world and anecdotal data do not always completely match. And of course, part of that is because the type of cows that SMIPS are involved in the research study is really different than the type that you know we have anecdotal data from. Um, a lot of times, in my mind, the reason that calves that are really big are problems are what? Dystocia. So they were slow, like they were dumb big bull calves, I and mean, there's nothing worse than a dumb big bull calf, right? Because, yeah, he's got lots of problems going for him. So if that's the case, then I mean, obviously, and we know that we can overfeed during late gestation and we can increase birth weight and that's a problem, but I would venture to guess that that's not as big of an issue in most of our operations as we worry about. Because sometimes I know that's another, like I use my dad as a classic example, if he knew how much I talked about him across what I'm making, get him right. <laughs> um, but sometimes it's like, to me, well, I don't know, I know she's kind of thin, but I don't think I have to get bigger. And I'm like, yeah, but do you want her to calve really thin? Because I don't think that's a good thing. Um, so I think it's all about keeping the balance. And that's why actually, you know, traditionally, we would say you're going to add more weight to a cow after you wean her, so you don't have to worry about late gestation. The interesting thing is, the data that shows that you actually let her lose a little weight then and put it back on, they didn't increase birth weight. And they have a lot of cows. And they work similar genetics to this type of the world. So, I mean, I can't tell you for sure, but does that make sense? I would say, yeah. you know, the other thing is to remember that if your cows are thin when they calve, they're not going to have a very good preg rate that year. And you can't put weight back on them after they calve unless they don't milk at all. And so, in that situation, if you're going to have calves that don't perform well, you at least want your cows to breed back, right? I mean, that, that's my take, but again, I try not to tell people what to do, especially since that's not part of my job description. Except for my grad student, I told them what to do. Any other questions? Well, if you find me later, you're welcome to chat, or if you're ever in Laramie and want to stop by, feel free. Thank you for